Good? Good. Great. Uh, okay, so today we're going to fly through the general viruses chapter, a cellular parasite. Uh, we'll quickly review viroids, satellites, and prions, and then get on to viruses themselves, starting with uh, bacterial viruses that are called bacteriophage, or phage for short. And uh, we'll talk about general characteristics of all viruses and the two different ty types, which are RNA or DNA. And uh, then we'll go into um, certain specific viruses that affect us generally uh, here in Southern California particularly. And of course we cannot go into lots of viruses because there are half as many viruses as there are parasites on Earth, and there are more parasites than stars in the sky. So it is impossible to do anything other than to look at a few, uh, the whole general characteristics, and then a few specific ones that affect us generally. Um, so that's what we're going to try to do. And then when we finish uh, the general chapter on viruses, we're going to go over the specific uh, virus that is everyone's the most afraid of. Every generation has a disease that they're most afraid of. For your great-grandparents, it was, uh, not well, great-great-grandparents, it was smallpox. Then great-grandparents, it was consumption or tuberculosis. Then for your grandparents, it was polio. And after polio uh, came HIV AIDS. And uh, so every generation has some particular uh, disease or illness that they're extremely frightened about. And so uh, we're going to try to dispel the myths and uh, give a little bit of education about HIV AIDS. And then we're going to go over the 13 parasites. They're called the great neglected diseases of mankind. And uh, 12 of the 13 are eukaryotic parasites, and one is a new re-emerging virus. Anybody have an idea what the word re-emerging virus means? Come back. The one that we had, we thought we defeated. Voila, it's back. And it's called dengue fever or breakbone fever and it uh, was almost wiped out and uh, it spread by uh, various kinds of biting mosquitoes, uh, particularly one particular kind, uh, one particular species of mosquito that we thought we wiped out because we basically polluted the entire environment with DDT and 245T and then when we discovered that it's in your uh, like probably every person in here, if you had, uh, if you were a girl and you had a baby, we could find it in your breast milk. Uh, it's persistent in the environment. Uh, we thought once we could get rid of it by dumping it at sea, so we dumped huge amounts off the coast of California, and of course it got into the food chain and the fish, and so uh, DDT and 2,4-D, we have no idea what 400 years of exposure to it will do, but we do know it's terribly persistent and it did cause uh, almost the extinction of the bald eagle and several bird species because it causes their egg shells to be too thin. So we'll be talking about dengue fever, a breakbone fever that's back and spreading up from Mexico and Texas into Southern California. The God, we live in a desert and the mosquitoes aren't here so bad, but in the um, southeast it's not going to be pretty. Anyway, that's the last Topic. So the topics on the next bi-weekly, which is the last day of class, the 22nd or 23rd of May, depending on your class or when you come in to take it, on that day you have three things going to happen. One, you have to bring in your paper, your typed formal unknown report, and I will grade it in class while you are taking the bi-weekly test over chapters 10, 11, HIV, AIDS, and the 13 parasites. Uh, then when you get out, you will take your paper away and do the minor corrections, hopefully, that are needed to get a 90 or above. Of course, if it's a disaster, you'll have 12 hours to fix it. Um, also on that day, the parasite bonus is due. 
Uh, we call it the parasite cards. We give you 25 points for it, but really most people just type it up on a sheet of paper in an outline form or something like that because it's easier to do. And it's a study sheet for the day you're going to have that test. And there are seven questions about 13 parasites. And it's online and we discussed it the other day. What was your question? Can you explain the points? So which points? I already did. Last class. Were you here? <laughs> okay, if you go to chapter 11, eukaryotic parasites, and go to the bottom of the page after the viroids and everything, you will see there are seven questions about the following uh, parasites that I'm going to ask you. What's their scientific name? What's their common name? Uh, what are the disease symptoms? Where is it found? What's the causative agent? That sort of thing. And Beyond that, there's a little button that says my outline or something like that, and I have outlined all the things that you have to answer about those 13 parasites. And you cannot copy and paste, but you can reword what I put there. And that's due because that's on the test, that's why I'm making it a bonus. So you can go ahead and get started on it. And uh, usually takes about six or seven pages to do it. You on. Need to answer the question. Yeah, you just put it in outline form, uh, like they are, each one goes by a class. For instance, there is the microscopic tissue roundworms, that's filarial diseases. And there are elephantiasis, two causes, Wisteria bancrofti and Brugia malaghi. Then there's river blindness, which is onchocerasis, and then there is... Um, Diarofilaria immedius, which is heartworms, and then there's Loa Loa and the African eyeworm. Loa Loa is the American eyeworm, and the African eyeworm is the African eyeworm. All those are filarial diseases. The next one disease is a roundworm disease. It's the largest worm in history. It's called the guinea worm. It's about four feet long, and uh, it, we have really a good hope of getting rid of it. And then after the, that comes the non-segmented flatworms, which are the flukes. And we're all only going to go over the liver fluke, even though there is in <laughs> intestinal, lung, liver, kidney, and one more fluke. So, but we're only going to go over the liver fluke. And then after the worms comes the protist disease, which is malaria, which is called plasmodial. There are eight different kinds, but we're only going to go through malignant malaria, which is plasmodium falciparum. After that, there is the protist, the tri, trypanosome protist. There's African and American trypanosome. Africans, African sleeping sickness. American is called Chagas. After that is Lishmania, three different kinds of Lishmania. Oriental sore, uh, Brazilian leishmania, and Kala Azar. And then the final of the 13 is dengue fever. The virus. And you can see all that there. And if you have trouble, I'll point it out for you. So here is everybody's been saying, What other bonus can I have? I need another bonus. All right, one more bonus. Okay. And this is five points added to the final exam. Five points is not a lot, but for one page, you know, 3% of the final exam. And what do I want you to do? I'll have an article online uh, tomorrow at the bottom of the first page of the website. So you're going to have to go all the way down to the bottom. And it's going to be talking about AIDS denialists. We have one who teaches next door. Mm -hmm who says that AIDS doesn't exist, it's just bad lifestyle, and that if you drink pure water uh, or things like that, you won't get HIV AIDS because it doesn't exist. Really? And so uh, these are people that uh, deny the existence of AIDS, not because they're, uh, usually because they're upset that it's, has been traced back to Africa, and they think it's some sort of racist attack on them. Although I don't think we uh, blame people in the Southwest for Southwestern pulmonary syndrome, or we don't 
blame the people in Korea for hantavirus because it was discovered around Hantan. But anyway, they get all hysterical about it. And so uh, we want to talk about it because most of their ways of doing their disinformation is called pseudoscience. And it's used for a lot of things, pseudoscience. Uh, the same mechanisms are used where they take the answer they want to find and then they look for the evidence to support it. Instead of taking the evidence and drawing a conclusion, they draw the conclusion it doesn't exist because it's a bias, blah, blah, blah. And then they look for evidence to support them and they discard everything else. And there's a lot of famous people that are AIDS denialists, including uh, one woman that was such a denialist that not only did she die, but she caused her baby to die because she denied it in treatment. So there's a whole bunch of stuff about that that you'll see. Anyway, uh, final exams on the 28th at 1.30, the 29th at 8 a.m., and the 30th at 5.30. If you want to take it in other than your regular class, which will be the 29th at 8 a.m., you have to send me an email to get a seat number. And there are only 15 seats extra in each one. So when you send me an email, you have to say, I am in class that's going to have it on the 29th. I want to take it on the 28th. And I will return email a seat number that you have to print and bring to the final exam. And when you come to the final exam, you have to bring your final exam packet, and if you go online, you can see on the website what's supposed to be in that. What's your question? The question is, um, our day is the 28th, yes? Yes. 29th. The 29th. 8 a.m. Oh, so I was on a Tuesday instead of a Monday? Wednesday. Wednesday? This is Tuesday. This is Wednesday. This oh, is okay. Thursday. This was Wednesday. So. Thank you. All right, anyone have any other questions about anything? All right, let's uh, wander on through the lecture today. I'm going to flip off and get a little bit better projection for them. Okay, so we're going to be talking about heroids, satellites, and acellular, other acellular parasites today. We're going to fly through some things that we already have gone over. Uh, viroids are circular, low molecular weight, usually single-stranded RNA. They're only 246 to 399 nucleotides, so they are the smallest entity of disease. The smallest thing that can cause a disease on this earth is a viroid. And they are uh, overwhelmingly plant pathogens. There's only one known animal viroid and one suspected. The known one is hepatitis D or delta hepatitis. It's unique in the fact that it requires an enzyme from an active infection of hepatitis B. So uh, you have to have an active infection of B to get D. And since we have a vaccine for B, that means that you can prevent D as well as B with the hepatitis B vaccine. That's the good news. The bad news is that hepatitis B is not a terribly good vaccine and you need boosters. Uh, you need to be checked every five years to see if you still have a titer for it and get a booster. Um, so many people think they get it when they're a child and they never have to get it again and that is not true. So if you're dealing with the public, uh, hepatitis B, remember, is transferred by blood-to-blood -blood contact it used to be a sexually transmitted disease. How can something used to be a sexually transmitted disease? Anybody have an idea? How can something used to be something and now still exist and not be? Any guesses? Nope. Nope. Oh, close. She said condoms. 
The answer is a sexually transmitted disease is exactly what it says. The primary way that it moves from one person to another person is by sex. And since the age of HIV AIDS, because of people using barrier precautions to prevent the spread of HIV AIDS, the primary way in which hepatitis B moves from person to person now is needle stick, contaminated blood, or sharing needles instead of by sex. So since it no longer is the majority of transmissions related back to a sexual transmission, it is no longer considered a sexually transmitted disease in this country. Of course, in other countries it could be. And um, hepatitis B has some unique things like it's endemic in some Asian countries, meaning that it's everywhere. And so uh, it's an interesting virus that we'll be talking about later. What's hepatitis A? <laughs> hepatitis A, remember they're only thing in common between all of these is they are infections of the liver. Hepatitis A and B are viral infections of the liver. A is the most easily transmitted thing on earth. It's what they call oral or fecal oral transmission, meaning who or pee in the water or food. And you can get it by saliva, kissing, semen, vaginal secretion, sweat, just about any way that where someone is pouring off the infectious particles, in other words, they're early in infection, and someone has never had it and is susceptible, you can get, you can pick it up. So it's the most easily. And most people in the United States get hepatitis A by eating raw seafood, such as raw oysters, because oysters grow in a bay where a river or a stream with a porta potty or a septic system that's not working properly drains into the river and the river then feeds the bay and the bay feeds the oyster bed and they don't really find out that people are uh, you know there's no way to test the water to see if the virus is there you just have to look for E. coli so, so anyway to get D you have to have a lot uh, active infection of B so Effectively, there is a vaccine for D in the fact that if you don't get B because you were vaccinated, then you can't get D. Uh, there is also another one that we suspect it is a cancer, a kidney cancer that only people in Western Australia get, but it's not been proven to be a viroid yet, so we don't, we just say it's suspected. Remember, it's naked RNA. It doesn't have a protein coat. It doesn't have a, uh, a envelope or a membrane around it. It's just RNA floating around in the environment. And most often it is, uh, or always, it is acquired by contact. In plants, you can walk through a field and then, that is infected and then walk through a field that is not infected. And by crushing the stems when you walk on them of a few plants, or a few leaves, you can transmit these viroids. So viroids are carried by contact, and they are, there is no treatment. All you do is plow the field under, and uh, then you can't plant the same thing there for 25 years. Uh, it doesn't have an envelope, and it doesn't have an outer covering. They don't require helper viruses. They reproduce in the nucleus. Uh, and here's a test question. If there are a piece of RNA, since certain RNA viruses, the piece of RNA inside can act as if it is messenger RNA. Those are called positive RNA viruses. Is this piece of RNA messenger RNA? And the answer is no. How it acts is it takes over the nucleus of a cell, <clears throat> but it doesn't prescribe, it is not translated directly into a protein. Uh, anybody know what non-filterable, non-filterable agents of disease are? <clears throat> These are things that are small in the bacteria that we can't make a filter with holes small enough to prevent them. So this is called a non-filterable agent of disease, and of course that would be viruses and viruses. Okay, so 
Any other, um, by the way, there's 1,142. In, in 09, there were 51 Derloids. Now there's 1,142. So they are being discovered, and I suspect there will be more animal Derloids discovered. Anyone have any questions about Derloids? Did you re have you started reviewing the old exams on this? It's time to start working on the multiple choice questions. Here are some of the questions I will ask. Does it have a protein coat? No. No. Does it have an envelope? No. no. How many uh, nucleotide RNA sequences are there? 249 is the smallest. It's a mostly a disease of what kingdom? plants. Uh, is there a vaccine for it? Not directly. Indirectly because of B. There is for a, the human viroid. Uh, let's see one other. Oh, does this RNA, naked RNA, act as if it is messenger RNA? No. No. And where does it act to take over the cell? Nucleus. In the nucleus. Yeah. Uh, that question about whether this vaccine or not will have to be yes, no, but not directly. Yes, it will be specified. It will probably be requires hepatitis B for which there is a vaccine. 246 nucleotide? 200, is it? I think it's 249. 246. Nope, 246 to 399. There goes that dyslexia again. <laughs> Alright, satellites. Satellites are weird. <laughs> Satellite are 500 nucleotides to 2,000. Uh, most of them, again, are RNA. There is one DNA of one or two, and I suspect there will be more, but none of humans. Um, there are two kinds of satellites, and remember what's a satellite? Just looks like it's two viruses that are associated with each other. The key thing about these two viruses is they are unrelated evolutionarily, but they each require each other. So they are co-viruses. They need each other to exist. They are in a permanent association. And the satellite viruses, they are the, they're basically two, two complete viruses, right? Mostly single-stranded. And we have in this group the very first <coughs> virus of a virus. So make sure you know what a virus of a virus is. A virus of a virus, the first one is, and the name of a virus of a virus is called a virophage. Virophage. Um, if the satellite virus has within it, well, let's put it this way. The, code, the gene that codes for, remember, a virus is a protein coat with a piece of DNA or RNA inside it. If the gene for this capsid, this coat, this viral coat, on the outer one, if the gene for it's on the inner one, then that is called a satellite nucleic acid. They are, again, mostly RNA. There's one or two DNA. And a special kind of satellite nucleic acid is one that the, uh, the piece of RNA is circular. Always before, you know, they were like this or they look like this. So, interesting, but are they important to animals? There's only one virus that's a satellite, it's a bees, and I'm upset about bees not being, but I'm not really upset about satellites because there are no satellite human diseases. So as of now, you know, there are lots of them, and so eventually I'm sure there will be, but right now there isn't. So what do you need to remember? The two viruses are associated, one, in one case they're called satellite viruses, they are single-stranded RNA, and they are complete viruses. Each one's a complete one. If one of them has a gene needed for the other one, it's a satellite nucleic acid. 
There are both DNA and RNA forms, but overwhelmingly they're RNA. And overwhelmingly in both cases, these are diseases of plants. So satellite viruses are single-stranded RNA, and you can see there's one animal of an insect, the bee. The rest of them are tobacco and tomato and all of these things. So satellite nucleic acids again, look at them, still almost all uh, crop diseases. Let's get back to prions. Prions are our spongiform encephalopathies. And remember, you must know the classifications of the four different kinds of spongiform encephalopathy. Every animal we know of has a random, sporadic, occasional, very rare spongiform encephalopathy. What is a spongiform encephalopathy? It's a hole in the brain caused by a normal brain protein all folding into an abnormal, more stable, non-functional shape called a prion. And prions, whenever they come across a normal shaped brain protein, they will convert it to the more stable, non-functional, and stick together in long chains, and the cells die because they're non-functional. So that leaves holes in your brain, which is what spongy form means. Your brain looks like a sponge, which if you look at a sponge, it's not solid. It has little holes all in it. All right, so. Uh, the disease itself is caused by a malformed or a malfolded, mal meaning bad folding, bad for us, not bad for the protein. The protein is actually better for the protein because it is more stable and almost indestructible in the malformed prion state. What's the normal one called? Remember that this stuff is all so new that we just have to say our own nomenclature because if you look in different books, you have different things. So we're going to call the normal brain protein PRP. And the one that's misfolded, same amino acids in the same order with one to five mutations, but just one mutation can cause it to fold into the malformed, non-functional shape that sticks together in long chains, dies, and leaves holes. And that's called a prion. And the guy who came up with that terminology is Stanley Prusner, who received the 1997 Nobel Prize for his protein-only hypothesis. And the protein-only hypothesis says that this disease is on only caused by a misfolded protein that is stable and almost indestructible and uh, non-functional and those cells die. Um, so let's talk about the different kinds of spongiform encephalopathy. If we don't know where the spongiform encephalopathy came from, if we don't know how it arose, we have no idea, we have no connection, no idea. No evidence, then it's called idiopathic. We're idiots about how this person got this disease. All right, next, sporadic. That is, every mammal, every animal ever discussed, looked at, has had occasional, very rare, a baby born or animal born with a mutation that causes this disease, and that animal dies. And that's where it ends because they don't reproduce. It's not spread on that way. It's just a mutation in the genes that code for this protein in their brain and it misfolds and the animal dies. And that's called sporadic or random spongiform encephalopathy. And in humans, it was discovered around 1900 by two German doctors and so it was named after them Kreutzfeldt-Jakob's disease. Kreutzfeldt-Jakob's. Uh, what's interesting about the form that's random is only about one-third to 40% of the brain is lost to holes. The other forms has much greater loss of brain tissue. All right, in, in sheep, 
The sporadic form was originally seen in sheep and goats, and it was called scrapie. In deer and elk, it's called chronic wasting disease. And maybe originally, and we're not sure, but originally it must have occurred in New Guinea. And there they named it kuru. So the very first instance of a person dying of a sporadic spongiform encephalopathy in New Guinea was probably kuru. Of course, then it was became transmissible when they ate each other. All right, uh, so let's talk about the second kind of spongiform encephalopathy, the first being sporadic, the second one being genetic. And the genetic one is sort of self-eliminating because you can screen for it genetically and the organisms that, uh, the babies that are born with it die almost immediately. And they, it's called fatal fetal insomnia or Birchman Strassler Slinkner, which I prefer to call GSS. All right? And almost always the babies die nearly immediately, but sometimes they do last for a couple of years. The one we're afraid of is the third kind. And the third kind is called transmissible or contagious. Uh, spongiform encephalopathy, and you can get this by contaminated instruments. Any medical instrument, uh, respirator, catheter, uh, scalpel, anything that's been used on an organism that has a transmissible variety can be transmitted to another one because you cannot effectively sterilize instruments that have been used on someone. Uh, if you look at the mechanisms, if you do the micro 40 uh, reading on sterilization, you will find that the way in which we can sterilize some equipment from prions is so harsh and so lengthy that most of the time all parts that have been used on someone are just thrown away because it requires extremely high temperature or it requires extremely high temperature and pressure plus being soaked in like a one normal solution of calcium hydroxide which is extremely harsh treatment. So remember effectively and in most conditions prion contaminated materials cannot be sterilized. Uh, the uh, USDA and FDA do have protocols for things such as uh, plastic uh, respiratory equipment that's been used that can uh, be sterilized, they say, <laughs> I wouldn't trust it, but anyway, they say they have protocols that can sterilize, effectively sterilize uh, prions, but just remember, if you get it by a piece of equipment that was contaminated, it's called iatrogenic transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. Why were these forms limited? Because there was a species barrier, and the only animal that we thought could get this didn't transmit it to people. And so we really didn't worry about spongiform encephalopathies until we discovered that sheep fed to cows have no species barrier virtually between a sheep and a cow. And since there's none between a cow and most other mammals, uh, that is the root in which transmissible encephalopathies uh, came into other animals, such as house cats, pets, zoo animals, and eventually humans. So a person eating a scrapey sheep is not going to get a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. Why? There's a high species barrier between sheep and people. We don't get their diseases and we don't get this one from them. But if a cow is fed a sheep material that is contaminated with neurological material such as spinal cord or brain from a scrapey sheep, the cow will get their form of, of transmissible spongiform encephalopathy called BSC, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, nicknamed mad cow. 60% of their brain will be destroyed. So remember, it's much greater than the random of 33%, almost double. And any animal that eats neurological material from this cow, it looks like, can pick it up. And so 
we call the variety where we either ate a mad cow or we ate a deer and elk because this is also transmissible to humans. So if you eat this or this, you will get the human variety of transmissible, and it's called little b CJD or CJD NV, new variant. Why? Is it different? It's much quicker, and much more amount of the brain is lost. Question? The dropping cow is the same as mad cow, or is it, what is it bobine? Dropping What's it? Or dropping oh, downer cows. Downer, cow, downer cows is a general term for any cow that's sick that can't stand up. Oh. And downer cows went into renderings as well as scrapey sheep. We think that a few of those cows may have had BSC naturally. They were sick, so they put in there. But most people believe that the way the cows got it was from scrapey sheep, because a lot of scrapey sheep was put in renderings. Does anyone have any questions about prions? Yes? What about the pigs? Because we were watching the video about pigs. Right, pigs can get it from cows, but we, I don't know any information about whether pigs, people can get it from pigs. We don't usually eat pig brain or pig spinal cord. So only if you eat like cow brain, you can get it like it's Right, it's for instance, if a, if a hunter killed a deer and only took the steaks and didn't contaminate, didn't break the spinal uh, fluid, didn't get it leaked onto any of the other things or the brain, then there, there are guidelines for properly harvesting a deer and still being able to eat the meat and not get it. So I'll have to look into this. the pig. That's an interesting thing because I do know that pigs can get it from BSC. How about from sheep? What about? From people? Uh, yeah. If people eat sheep, if they eat sheep, sheep or goat, they can't get it. No, I mean. Sheep brain? Yeah. Nope. No? No. Then how about Kuru? How about what? Kuru? Kuru is from eating people brain. <laughs> people eating people brain. Not fun. I hear that, you know, the breasts are the best part. <laughs> this is like chicken. All right. So these are just some of the important uh, terms and concepts. One, the protein-only hypothesis is revolutionary. It's, uh, like a, it's like breaking the first law of the Ten Commandments of Science, that something can call, have, be an agent that can spread without reproduction with DNA or RNA. Remember, there is no DNA or RNA involved in this. This is just a protein acting like a magnet on pieces of metal. You know how if you go up to pieces of metal, you can change the way they're laid out on the table by bringing a magnet near it. So that's what this prion does. PRPC is one of the designations for normal brain protein. And remember, the protein that makes up the neurons in the brain is 254 amino acids. And we found that just changing one of those can cause it to refold. The one, how do you designate scrapey? And it's called PRPSC, and then prion. Remember, it's resistant to changes in pH. It's resistant to radiation. It's resistant to normal autoclaves, disinfectants, sterilant, formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde. It's resistant to cold, freezing, liquid nitrogen, drying. It's resistant to detergents, antiseptics, and disinfectants. So there are some very extreme protocols on how to get rid of prions, and most of them are so extreme they damage equipment. This is the first We've talked about it, but we haven't emphasized it before. And this is a very important term right now because you're, almost everything you discover late after this is going to be what we call a zoonosis. Can anyone tell me what a zoonosis is? Read it. When, an or, when a disease or an organism or a virus or anything evolves with one species, and then moves to a new one, 
It's called a zoonosis. Like it because we discovered it in zoos. That the caretakers of animals were getting animal diseases that people didn't normally get. And so that's where we came up with the term. And since your species did not evolve with this pathogen over hundreds of thousands of years, do you think you have any defense against it? Think about it. You're getting a disease, let's say, of a pig. How many pig antibodies do you think you've ever made? None. So are you going to have protection from a pig disease? That's why they're really worried about like putting uh, hemoglobin that's made in pigs into people. Will we pick up diseases that pigs that we have no history of? And so we don't know. We don't know. So anyway, zoonosis is, there are lots of zoonosis. HIV is a zoonosis. Anthrax is a zoonosis. Originally anthrax was in cows. Now it's in people and we use it as a weapon. People mail it through the mail, you know. Anthrax spores. And originally uh, a type of chim a subtype of chimpanzee found in Cameroon was HIV. And how do almost all zoonoses transmit to people? We eat the animal. If we eat the host then in preparation of the food, not, how many of you wear gloves when you pull the meat out of the refrigerator or cut up a chicken? Nobody. So if that animal has a disease that can find a host cell in us and you nick yourself or you have been biting your fingernails or you have uh, fallen down on the concrete and roughed up your palm, you have then provided access of that animal pathogen into people and if it can find a similar host cell to ours it will inhabit us and that's why zoonosis they uh, in Cameroon and areas the people were starving they they went out just like we did in the 17 and 1800s and people even do today they go into the forest and they hunt and they eat wild food and when they eat wild food, and they're preparing the food, cutting it up, skinning it, making the steaks and all that, if they get it into cuts, then they can get the disease. And so this is zoonosis. But not if it's already cooked. Usually not if it's already cooked. It's usually in the preparation and the skinning. Anyone ever looked at any of the programs put out by TED? Technology yeah. and Educational Development? Uh, anyway, there is a, a program put out by TED that discusses viral monitoring. Viral and zoonotic world monitoring. We do not want what happened to HIV to happen to the world again. What happened to HIV? We didn't notice it spreading around the world. It was bloodborne. We import blood from all over the world. We transfuse blood. We test it for everything. But if we don't know something's there and we don't have a test, are we going to find it? No. no. And so we had a disease that jumped into man three times that we can prove since the early 1900s. And one time it spread around the world. And the reason it spread around the world was the introduction of blood transfusion and non-sterile needle practices in poor countries. And so we don't want this to happen again. And so what uh, this viral monitoring and zoonotic world monitoring program is, it's set up in the Bay Area. And what they do is they pay hunters all over the world, South America, Central America, um, Africa, Asia, everywhere they go into the forest, they are paid something like five bucks. They're given a FedEx package, a little envelope, a Ziploc bag, and a piece of filter paper. And every time they kill a wild animal, they drip some of the blood onto the filter paper, put it in the Ziploc bag, and mail it to this lab in uh, the Bay Area which looks for diseases we have never seen before. 
and they have found over 7,000, particularly retroviruses like HIV that we have never seen before. And we want to be ahead of it in the future because HIV AIDS spread around the world and we didn't even know it was there. So this viral and zoonotic world monitoring program is very important. And if I ask you a question about it, you must be able to tell me what are they doing. So what are they doing? There are lots of places in the forest and in the rainforest and in places where people don't normally live where people are going in and harvesting food from wild animals. And they are paying these hunters to take blood samples and mail them in so we can look for viruses we have never seen before and be ahead of it. So it never happens again what happened in the past. Well, then how is it happening in zoos? I mean, in what? In zoos? Who is, were animals eating other animals? Was no, like it's the zookeeper? zookeepers. You know, have, have you ever taken care of a cat? Yeah. In fact, I'll show you right there, there, <laughs> and yeah, right I've got, there. I've got them too. I can show you. Yeah. Them. You play with your cat, yeah. or, you know, there are all kinds of ways in which you could come in contact. You know, one animal tears an animal, another animal apart. You have to go in there and clean up. You could come in contact with their blood and so forth. Of course, all the people with their dirty minds think about people having sex with animals, and that doesn't, that is not a significant way. Uh, you know, there are two sexually transmitted diseases that are zoonotic. One is syphilis, one a very, very old, old, old disease. Guess where it was originally? Sheep. And of course, people with their dirty minds think, oh, well, there was these really bored sheep herders. <laughs> no, we ate them. We prepared food, and that particular bacteria learn to live in us a lot better. And this very similar bacteria in sheep causes rare spontaneous abortions in a sheep. And what does syphilis cause in people? Horrible, horrible deformities and insanity and all that. So remember, a zoonosis is almost always worse in the new species than the old one because they didn't evolve together. Remember, when two organisms evolve together, they're going to try to wipe each other out. And one's going to get ahead of the other one, and the other one's going to get ahead, and eventually they'll reach a sort of a balance between, and that where they both exist. Because remember, that's evolution. One will try to wipe out the other, a parasite, until they accommodate each other. And if one is better than the other one, one of the other one becomes extinct. You don't want that to happen if that's your food source. You don't want your food source to be extinct. You want them to be miserable and live for many years suffering with you as a parasite. But remember, parasites that kill the host are not a good thing for the parasite. All right, the species barrier, remember that is the fact that in most diseases, particularly in viruses, you don't get a virus that evolved in another organism. We don't get canine distemper because we're not a cow. No, I mean a dog. We don't get uh, feline leukemia because we're not a cat. So, all right, what is passaging? It looks like passaging. It's passaging. And passaging is a term that says that if you introduce a very contagious uh, pathogen into a small population, and you put a whole bunch of very susceptible uh, animals around them, it will move quickly between them and change characteristics and become more deadly. You know that. Ever had a kid go into a nursery school and he comes in with a flu that no one else has had before and all of a sudden everybody gets it and the kid at the last it's much worse than the kid at the first they got it. So that's called passaging. That's when you quickly move the pathogen within a group of hosts and it changes characteristics. Um, and we talked about this. This was just about susceptibility to prions. If you have at that one site on the PRP protein, 250 amino acids, remember you get one 
uh, from your mom and one from your dad. It takes two to code for a particular protein. If you have the valine valine, they, don't, they seem to be resistant to prion formation. If you have the valine methionine, you're moderate. But if all of the people that got it were methionine methionine. And that's called methionine homozygous. So they're the most susceptible to being exposed to prions and getting the disease. Okay, what else? Why is that go blank? There it goes. A lot of people get all upset about prions. Look at how many people. It's up to around a thousand now, but still, this is good news because this disease we got ahead of. Before it spread around the world, we learned how to control it and we're getting more and more control over it. And so the number of cases is now declining tremendously. And one of the big reasons, name two ways in which England has become the country with the least amount of new transmissions. They had it first, but what did they do to stop it from continuing and getting worse and worse and worse? Because with mad cow disease, first year there was 10. By the second year there was 100,000. Why didn't that happen in people? There was 10, and there was 12, and there was 15, and then there's 9. They killed every cow that had ever been fed, rendered food. They then uh, test every piece of meat of any kind that's sold in England before it's put on the market. They have a quick test. So if they slaughter something, they test it immediately. They can find out before they put the meat out get the animals infected. All right, uh, so this is just the dates. Let's talk about viruses, general viruses. First of all, viruses of bacteria. Or let's even go back further. What's a virus of a virus? Virophage. What's a virus of a bacteria? Bacteriophage. You will often hear bacteriophage just called phage. So be careful that you know that the word phage is just sort of like slang or abbreviation for bacterial phage. And these are viruses of bacteria, and they all have a very strange shape. This shape is called complex. They are all DNA. Inside the capsid, remember the capsid is the protein coat outside. Inside is a piece of DNA. And these little tail receptors are what stick to specific proteins of by species, all the way down to subspecies. So these bacteriophages, we actually use them for identification, like if I wanted to know, if she said, I think my bacteria is Enterobacter orogenes, we could order a bacteriophage that would only kill Enterobacter orogenes and spread it out on a plate, put this bacteriophage on it. If it ate holes in the bacteria, we would know it's Enterobacter orogenes. So we can actually use it for identification. That's how specific bacteriophage are. That's how we test if an E. coli is the one with the toxin. You order bacteriophages that will only kill it. Therefore, you've identified. So, and what is the, this shape of a bacteria called? Complex. It is very bizarre shape. No other virus looks like this. So, uh, bacteriophages have a complex shape. They're very species specific. We don't name them with any special names anymore. We just say E. coli, ba, uh, phage, and then we say a number. So they're given numbers. They're all DNA. So let's talk about uh, the parts of viruses. These are bacterial viruses. Let's talk about other viruses. Remember, the outer coat is called the capsid. And the capsid 
is made up of identical little pieces over and over again called capsomeres. So identical capsomeres make up the capsid, which is the protein outer coat. All right, inside it has either DNA or RNA, and it may have an enzyme or two. Like, for instance, the virus that causes AIDS has an enzyme called reverse transcriptase inside that enables it to convert viral RNA into viral DNA because remember it's going to insert its genetic material into yours and you have DNA so it's got to convert to DNA to insert so remember it has RNA or DNA it cannot have both that's a test question what's the outer protein coat called? capsid What's it made of? Identical capsomeres. Finally, some viruses, instead of exploding the host cell and being released, like bacteria pods do, they sort of uh, bud through it like a, vir uh, like a yeast. They buds. And if they bud through the plasma membrane of the host, they pick up a piece of that plasma membrane, and it's called an envelope. And remember, it's a glycoprotein, like a membrane, like the plasma membrane. It is essentially a piece of plasma membrane of the host cell. And of course, if you bud through one a T cell's plasma membrane that will enable you to attach to another T cell because you're taking a part of the plasma membrane of one and that it will notice and stick to the plasma membrane of the very same type. What's budding through? Budding through is here you have a host cell and what happens is that the virus will come through here like this and it will push up through the plasma membrane and then pick it up as it's released. Instead of what we call lysis, where the cell splits open, releasing all the virus particles. This is lysis. And this is buddy. This is worse because the cell doesn't die, it just loses energy and, and gets these holes in it from the budding and eventually it falls apart. While this one, the whole thing explodes, releasing virus particles. So this is sort of like taking a, um, an M&M and pushing it through a balloon. You push it through the outside, you know how it bulges out, and then it will eventually explode, and, pick, and when you pick that M&M, it will have a piece of balloon around it. So that's budding. And this is how they acquire envelopes, which are essentially plasma membranes that allow them to attach to the very same kind of host cell. You, this plasma membrane sticks to that one. So that means that you can kill envelope viruses very easily. Anything that messes up a plasma membrane will mess up an envelope virus. So if you have... Remember, this is an envelope. You have plasma membrane. You can touch it right here. So if you can mess up a plasma membrane, what messes up plasma membrane? Alcohol, um, detergents, that little uh, stuff that you use to disinfect your hand, that's ethanol. It's a gel ethanol. And it messes up plasma membrane. So what will it get rid of? bacteria and enveloped viruses. Now, what if the virus doesn't have an envelope? Then it's called naked and it's almost indestructible. Only radiation will kill naked viruses. So things like polio. Why did polio spread around the world? Because it was a naked virus and people pooped it into the water. So what? 
Chlorine doesn't kill it. Doesn't kill naked viruses. Is it so, still in a capsule? What? One, you have to bring in your paper, your typed formal unknown report, and I will grade it in class while you are taking the bi-weekly test over chapters 10, 11, HIV, AIDS, and the 13 parasites. Uh, then when you get out, you will take your paper away and do the minor corrections, hopefully, that are needed to get a 90 or above. Of course, if it's a disaster, you'll have 12 hours to fix it. Um, also on that day, the parasite bonus is due. Uh, we call it the parasite cards. We give you 25 points for it, but really most people just type it up on a sheet of paper in an outline form or something like that because it's easier to do. And it's a study sheet for the day you're going to have that test. And there are seven questions about 13 parasites. And it's online and we discussed it the other day. What was your question? Can you explain the bonus? So, which bonus? I already did. Last class. Were you here? <laughs> okay, if you go to chapter 11, eukaryotic parasites, and go to the bottom of the page after the viroids and everything, you will see there are seven questions about the following uh, parasites that I'm going to ask you. What's their scientific name? What's their... Good? Good. Great. Uh, okay, so today we're going to fly through the general viruses chapter, a cellular parasites. Uh, we'll quickly review viroids, satellites, and prions, and then get on to viruses themselves, starting with uh, bacterial viruses that are called bacteriophage, or phage for short. And uh, we'll talk about general characteristics of all viruses and the two different ki types, which are RNA or DNA. And uh, then we'll go into um, certain specific viruses that affect us generally. Uh, here in Southern California particularly. And of course we cannot go into lots of viruses because there are half as many viruses as there are parasites on Earth and there are more parasites than stars in the sky. So it is impossible to do anything other than to look at a few, uh, the whole general characteristics and then a few specific ones that affect us generally. Um, so that's what we're going to try to do. And then when we finish uh, the general chapter on viruses, we're going to go over the specific uh, virus that is everyone's the most afraid of. Every generation has a disease that they're most afraid of. Common name. Uh, what are the disease symptoms? Where is it found? What's the causative agent? That sort of thing. And Beyond that, there's a little button that says my outline or something like that, and I have outlined all the things that you have to answer about those 13 parasites. And you cannot copy and paste, but you can reword what I put there. And that's due because that's on the test, that's why I'm making it a bonus. So you can go ahead and get started on it. And uh, usually takes about six or seven pages to do it. You on. need to answer the question. Yeah, you just put it in outline form, uh, like they are, each one goes by a class. For instance, there is the microscopic tissue roundworms, that's filarial diseases. And there are elephantiasis, two causes, Wisteria bancrofti and Brugia malaiti. Then there's river blindness, which is onchocerasis, and then there is... Um, Dyrofilaria immedius, which is heartworms, and then there's Loa Loa and the African eyeworm. Loa Loa is the American eyeworm, and the African eyeworm is the African eyeworm. All those are filarial diseases. The next one disease is a roundworm disease. It's the largest worm in history because we basically polluted the entire environment with DDT and 245T, and then when we discovered that it's in your, uh, like, probably every person in here, if you had, uh, if you were a girl and you had a baby, we could find it in your breast milk. Uh, it's persistent in the environment. Uh, we thought once we could get rid of it by dumping it at sea, so we dumped huge amounts off the coast of California, and of course it got into the food chain and the fish, and so uh, 
DDT and 2,4-D, we have no idea what 400 years of exposure to it will do, but we do know it's terribly persistent, and it did cause uh, almost the extinction of the bald eagle and several bird species because it causes their egg shells to be too thin. So we'll be talking about dengue fever, a breakbone fever that's back and spreading up from Mexico and Texas into Southern California. The God, we live in a desert and the mosquitoes aren't here so bad, but in the um, southeast it's not going to be pretty. Anyway, that's the last topic. So the topic's on the next bi-weekly, which is the last day of class, the 22nd or 23rd of May, depending on your class or when you come in to take it. On that day, you have three things are going to happen. For your great-grandparents, it was, uh, not well, great-great-grandparents, it was smallpox. Then great-grandparents, it was consumption or tuberculosis. Then for your grandparents, it was polio. And after polio uh, came HIV AIDS. And uh, so, Every generation has some particular uh, disease or illness that they're extremely frightened about. And so uh, we're going to try to dispel the myths and uh, give a little bit of education about HIV AIDS. And then we're going to go over the 13 parasites. They're called the great neglected diseases of mankind. And uh, 12 of the 13 are eukaryotic parasites and one is a new re-emerging virus. Anybody have an idea what the word re-emerging virus means? Come back. The one that we had, we thought we defeated, voila, it's back. And it's called dengue fever or breakbone fever, and it uh, was almost wiped out, and uh, it's spread by uh, various kinds of biting mosquitoes, uh, particularly one particular kind. Uh, one particular species of mosquito that we thought we wiped out.